welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith and I'm very, very excited today to be kicking off a playthrough for 7th Continent Classic Edition. If you haven't checked out my setup video, which will help you understand how everything got to the table in its current state as well as prepare you for the different things I am adding into this playthrough, you want to check the link in the top right hand corner right now. Now for those of you that already saw that setup video and are raring to go with the playthrough, the one thing I'll mention for those new Newcomers is that we're using the classic edition as well as including the crystals song as well as using the mode from the crystal song expansion called prodigy mode and we're also incorporating the forbidden sanctuary as well as going after the Forbidden Sanctuary Curse, or at least trying to lift that curse. We've already selected our character. It is Mary Kingsley. So without further ado, let's find out more about her backstory. At the age of 30, Mary went off alone exploring Africa in order to complete her late father's work. Through contact with the local tribes, some of which were cannibalistic, she learned jungle survival, canoeing, and discovered new species of fish. Upon returning to her native England, she received an offer to join an expedition to a new mysterious continent. She decided to postpone writing her memoirs as the lure of adventure always comes first. 1907. A renowned explorer, you have just come back from the first expedition on the seventh continent, a mysterious land that was recently discovered off the coast of Antarctica, and probably the very last terra incognita in the world. You are recovering from your adventure when, while reading the daily newspaper, you realize that several other members of the expedition have disappeared suddenly for unknown reasons. Coincidentally, you have been lethargic for a few days, feeling feverish and finding it difficult to get up from bed, a cold shiver runs up and down your spine, you have to face the facts, and evil is consuming you from within. At nightfall, you fall into a restless sleep without knowing that, for you, this is only the beginning. The piercing cries of seagulls pull you out of a deep slumber. You try your best to gather your bearings. Where on earth are you? How did you end up in this place? You seem unable to remember. Sifting through your journal, you come across an excerpt from John Smith's diary. John was an explorer from the Delta team who mysteriously disappeared during the first expedition. Nichols and I have discovered a collapsed building. To get inside, all you need is one room after another. We many traps. Nicholas lost his hand trying to pull the... He won't listen. Made an incredible finding have taken notes in my journal about how to make it through. The notes describe, John died. He chose the wrong, leaving nothing to chance. I left the tower with a few sheets from the journal. Following the wind, visited an underground temple, a heavy porculus, comfortable bed, uncontrollable anger. When I got out, the wind was still increasingly tired. Offered me shelter. Offered him to thank him. For days, there is snow everywhere. The freezing wind, hungry, couldn't find the others. So now we know more about Mary's backstory. We also know more about the curse using the clue card here on the one side, giving us some information that's going to come in handy as well when flipping it over. We can see here that every time a character must take one or more 50 cards, they may apply the following effect instead. So this is a may. We don't have to, but we can. Randomly take three of the four 450 cards available in the adventure deck. Reveal these three cards one after the other so as to obtain a three digit number. The first card you reveal is the hundreds, second is the tens, and the last is the ones. Take the card bearing the number you obtain from the adventure deck if available. If it is not, you may return the three 450 cards you took and start over from step one. Then return the three 450 cards you revealed. We'll want to keep this in mind every single time we can interact with a 50 card. Something else worth mentioning is that on the expansion for the Forbidden Sanctuary, there is a short description about the temple that we are trying to find in this curse. And it states, those who built this temple made sure that no one would come and disturb their precious treasure. You will need to learn some of its secrets before setting foot inside. Otherwise, each step could be your last. And based on what we just read from the clue card, that lines up pretty closely. 
Here's a look at the only card that is currently in our hand. And as you can see, it's a state card from the red icon of a hand in the top left hand corner. But let's read what's on this card because this card can be used to our advantage. It says, during the item step of an action you are involved in, you may discard one card with the keyword skill from your hand or your inventory in order to apply the following effect. That's a seven with a star. Now we'll talk about this when we start revealing cards for successes and how we can use this to our advantage. Below that we have an action here and that action is for a move or backtrack action. That's what that icon stands for. And below it it says, if you move to a terrain card where there is an explorer or fire figure, minus one action cards pulled. And that's essentially what that icon means there in blue with the negative one is that you'll be drawing one less card when taking an action in a space with an explorer or a fire figure. And now our journey with Mary begins and we're gonna try to see if we can lift the curse that plagues her from the Forbidden Sanctuary. Of course, we need to ensure we find the Forbidden Sanctuary as well as have enough knowledge to be able to get through it based on the narrative or flavor text from the expansion itself. Now, as you can see on the game board right now, we have one revealed tile. Mary is currently there. And as I talked about during the setup video, you'll see these white box all over the place as we play through the seventh continent, which means these are things we can interact with, actions we can take. So right now we could potentially pathfind to the left, which is the clouded area to the left-hand side or to the west. And we can also potentially pathfind to the east on the right-hand side. We could even take an action on the space we're in to the north, which is this one right here, in order to investigate or go see something. And the reason I know what that is is that I have the reference sheet for each of these actions and the icons inside of them. And it lets you know a little bit more about what exactly is going on with each of these actions. So that one with the map and the sword is an investigate, go see. And that's something I kind of want to do right off the hop. I want to see what that is just to start things off. And then once we get an idea there, we'll start taking a look to the left and to the right and see which way we think we should go. So now that you guys are aware of what action I want to take, let's talk about how an action is actually resolved. So right next to that white box, there is a blue diamond and a gold star. There's a number inside of each of them. The one inside the blue diamond relates to the action deck, which essentially is your energy. It tells you how many cards you need to pull. So in this case, I need to pull one action card from the top of my deck and place it face down in front of me. Now the plus next to the one means I can, if I wish, pull Pull more action cards and put them face down in front of me prior to checking to see for successes. And we know the number of successes we need based on the number in the gold star, which you can see on this one is zero. So it doesn't matter how many cards I pull out. I don't need to have any successes to have a successful interaction with this action. But the reason you wouldn't want to pull additional action cards is because you are trying to keep your action deck in check because it is your life, it's your energy. You don't want to just burn through this thing or you're gonna get into a situation where you can potentially die. When the action deck is drained all the way, the action deck will be reset. And then if you happen to pull a curse card in the future, well, game over. So we don't want that to happen, so we got to make wise decisions on how many cards we pull. For this action, the one requires us to pull one. Could take more, but I'm not going to. When you reveal a card as part of the action resolution, you'll see the only portion of the card that matters at this step is checking the left-hand column right here to see if there's any stars inside. If there's some full stars, then that's one success. If it's a half star, like you're seeing here, then you need to have pulled other cards that happen to have the other side of the star and you must physically be able to actually connect them. In other words, you can't use one half of a star on the right hand side like I have here with two other cards that have a left hand side of the card. That wouldn't count for two successes, that would only count for one. So now that we know we pass this particular check or action, the next thing we can do is you can see we have a blue hand in the top left hand corner of this particular card, which is considered a skill card. So the active player, which is me in this case, can choose one skill card among all the revealed of the result stage and pick one of those to actually place into their hand. I don't have to, but I can. And honestly, rope is a pretty useful thing. So I definitely will be adding this to my hand. 
Now that our action was successful, we can go ahead and take a look at the white bordered area to see what happens. And the thing that happens in this case, because it's really a guaranteed success, is card 268 gets pulled. The card states you notice an opening on one side of the tower. A good portion of the building is below the surface. If you want to explore it, you may need to hold your breath for a long time. Just before I go ahead and decide on my next action, I want to talk about the limitations of the number of cards you can have in your hand. You can easily reference this on the satchel and journal card, and depending on the number of players, in this case I'm playing solo, the far left hand column applies here. You can see it states with the blue hand, five, which means I can have up to five blue skill cards in hand. I decided to go ahead and take a rope card which is a blue hand skill card so that takes up one of the five i can only have four more to the left of it we've got four and a green hand and the green hand is for side quests companions and positive states i can only have four of those underneath of that we've got four black dice pictured and that can consist of up to four item cards combined the newly revealed card is called a permanent event card and we know this because of the golden like arrow you can see here at the bottom of the card and we need to ensure when we actually place the card that it's, of course, facing the same way as the rest of the cards that have been revealed. So in this case, top to bottom. And also that the arrow icon, more importantly, is pointing to the card in which the action revealed it. So you can see right here, the action icon on this particular arrow is exact same action icon as the one on our card. So we know they match. This will stay in play. It's a permanent event. On this card, we have some flavor text, which I already read, and we have an action, which we can interact with. There's a few icons I want to go over, though. So before we go over the icons, I want to mention the fact that the permanent event only has one action we can do. It's a swim or sail action as depicted in the white box. Now, the icons that relate to it, we have to take into account for different reasons. The red staircase icon that you're seeing there means that all players must get involved in this action in order to do it. In this case, that I'm playing solo with a single character, obviously I'm always going to be involved in all of my own actions. There's nobody else in play. So this red staircase is not going to matter for me in solo play. The red padlock is that players may not alter the default cost of the action. In other words, the number of cards to be drawn imposed by the action, unless they use the effects of cards from their hands and or their inventories. For solo play, the padlock also doesn't apply just like the staircase. And again, the reason for both of these not applying is because there's no other characters involved in the playthrough except for a single character, Mary Kingsley. These two red icons are really to put some additional rules around other characters participating in actions with Mary Kingsley. Everything else on the card we're familiar with, but you'll notice in the success area of this action in the white bordered area, we have a card number, but beside it, we have a flag with an icon inside of it. We'll talk about this in a moment because I'm actually going to go ahead and take the action. So that is going to hopefully, if I succeed, allow me to explain that particular portion of that success area as well as talk about the black area below it if I happen to fail. Now before we go any further with choosing an action, I want to talk about the two cards that are currently in my hand and the options I have in terms of using them. So first off, we have the rope card that I got in the last action. If I wanted to right now, I could go ahead and craft this item as an action. I have the build or craft icon up here and it states right beside it three plus. So bare minimum, I need to pull three cards and I can pull more if I want to in order to get zero successes. So I just stick with three and then I'd be able to build the rope, which means I take it from my hand and place it on the table as one of the four items in my inventory that I can have. Then I would take a die and set it to the value that's shown right here in the top right hand corner, which is a four. And I would now have access to make use of all the benefits down below here when taking actions that actually correspond to the three shown. Actions like climbing, making a fire, or pulling, pushing, or lifting something. Now let's talk about the state card in hand for Mary Kingsley. You can see right on it, the ability is during the item step of an action you are involved in, you may discard one card with the keyword skill from your hand or your inventory in order to apply the following effect. And that seven with a gold star basically means that it is worth one success for each seven icon, just a plain seven icon obtained during the result step of an action. So when you're looking on the left hand side of the action cards to 
see whether you got any gold stars. If you see any seven show up and you've basically activated this ability on Mary, you're going to get a success for every seven that shows up, which is pretty awesome. Now you have to make sure you're going to discard a card with the keyword skill from your hand. And ironically, that's exactly what I have here with the rope. So that would work out perfectly, whether it's in my hand or it's actually part of my inventory on the table with a durability die on it of four to start. And don't worry, we'll see this in action as we go through the playthrough, but at least you have an idea as to other ways we can interact with the seventh continent beyond just the map itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that permanent event action right now. And the one thing I could do is to discard the rope card in order to turn any seven into a success. I'm not gonna do that though, because I think the rope is gonna be very useful to actually create and put in our inventory later on. If I can hope to find some vine, I'll be able to create it more cheaply than the three action cards it requires at a bare minimum. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull one action card, hoping that I get the success I need if things go bad, you can see the failure conditions already listed on this one. So we know we're not going to take any kind of nasty condition from it. We'll just have to try again or decide if we want to try again. So let's go ahead and reveal one card off the top of the action deck and see how this goes. And just like that, we were successful. We got a star, thankfully, and half a star as well. So with there only being one card revealed in this particular action, I can choose if I want to place this one in my hand. I'm going to do so. It has this think action on it. It states I have to pull no action cards and I don't need any successes. So I can essentially just do this when I want. Choose one blue skill card in the discard pile and add it to your hand, then discard this. So right now it doesn't have any great functional use, but let's say hypothetically I did an action where I pulled three action cards off the top. I chose one, two of them went in the discard pile, but one of the ones I put in the discard pile I really wanted, this would be a way to remember that card back into my hand to make use of it later on, a pretty cool mechanic. So we found a building which was partially or majorly submerged in water and we swam towards it. Now I get to resolve the successful side of this action. You can see that bordered in white. There is a card numbered 40 there, but there's also an icon that we need to reference. And that icon comes from the clue card that we talked about earlier on. In the bottom left-hand corner of the clue card, you'll see the exact same icon that matches the icon on our permanent event, and it states plus 12 on it, which means we're gonna add 12 to the number that's shown there, so the card 40 is gonna turn into a 52. Based on the successful result of this action here, the 40 that was shown in that area, as well as adding 12 for this clue card to the 40, it's given me 52, so I've gone ahead and pulled that card. You'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner of that same 52 card, there is a number, which is 268 with a thumbs up. This is your confirmation that you've done the adding correctly and are revealing a card at the correct time. So in order to ensure you've done this correctly, simply go ahead and flip over the card that you did the action on and as long as the number actually matches which in this case it does 268 and 268 we know that we've done everything here correct the last thing that i want to note in regards to resolving this successful action is inside of this area where it states 40 you do have the option to just take the card as 40. you don't have to add any of your available icons with numerical values to it if you don't want to it's completely up to you but of course if it relates back to your clue or any quest items it's likely related to the curse that you're trying to do so you're going to want to actually bump that number up it'll be in your uh advantage to do so. We have found a timed event. We simply resolve this card and then discard it. It states, you swim along a flooded corridor for a painfully long time. Just before deciding to give up, you catch a ray of light in the water about 50 feet ahead. With a final effort, you reach an opening where you eventually resurface to catch your breath. Return all the cards on the board and in the past. Put a 517 card into play each player places their figures onto it. 
So Mary has resurfaced out of a pool of water here, gasping for breath, and in a completely different location inside of this building here. As you can see, I've gone ahead and placed a card to the right of us, as well as indicated right here by the arrow. And next thing I want to talk about is the fact the timed event that actually caused us to do this has been discarded into the past, and then that timed event mentioned to take everything that was in the past, as well as all the cards that were currently on the board, and return them back to the card decks so essentially I put them all back in the box and we have now arrived inside of this building and I have no idea what we walked into we've got a couple different actions we can do inside of this place we can do things like search or examine this central area right here or we could spot or observe this area over here to the bottom left not sure which one to pull here or which one to go after but neither one requires any action cards to be pulled so i mean that's a plus we should be able to take a look at both of them and make a decision as to how to proceed for my next action i'm going to choose to actually go ahead and search or examine that pool of water in the center of the room. The card to be pulled is 537. No action cards need to be pulled here, so I'm not pulling any more. And it states on the back of 537, there is a hole full of water in the center of the room. Now we already know that this pool of water is what helped us get into this chamber of this building already, but now we have some additional information by looking at it. It states here on it, in all likelihood, these flooded corridors should lead you back outside. Well, I don't like the term likelihood as if you can get lost trying to get back out. That doesn't sound good. In the bottom left hand corner for a swim action of two action cards and zero successes return all the and this is on the successful side of things return all the cards on the board and in the past put a 149 card into play and each player places their figure onto it so this will and should lead you back out uh, but you're gonna have to expend some energy to make sure you do so it doesn't look like there's anything too nasty there but it does have something on the right hand side it says finding your way underwater proves difficult you turn into the wrong Long corridor and fail to find the exit eventually running out of air and meeting your end your adventure ends here now this situation is worth explaining even though it's not going to apply to solo play whatsoever but so there's an understanding of why there's even a fail condition on this card at all because when you're playing solo you can't take actions collectively so in other words let's say hypothetically I had two characters and I was two hand playing both of them and they both happen to be in this chamber and and they both wanted to take this action to swim back down into that pool of water together. When you take a collective action, you are allowed to jig the numbers just a little bit. You can drop the amount of required action cards to be drawn down, for instance, by one. So I could drop it from a two to a one, but it would increase the amount of successes required from a zero to a one. So essentially I would take this check and make it a, from a two zero to a one one. And when you do that change, you can then see there is a way to fail this check. Currently, while playing solo, it is impossible to fail this check. I'm simply going to spend two action cards, and then because it only requires zero successes, I'm guaranteed to get back to where I came from. My next action is going to be to observe card 566. Costs no action cards to do this because no successes are required. And on the back of 566, it states an enigmic message has been written on the wall in front of you. Well, what do we have here? It states, you recognize the particular handwriting. It seems to be that of Nichols, the explorer who managed to get out of the Forbidden Sanctuary. His message suggests he was in an extravagant mental state, to say the least. The note reads, bloody Professor Smith, that nosy idiot. I've drunk the cap down to the dregs. To whoever reads this message, do not knock the cup over. Wow, this is absolutely ridiculous. Now, it's funny in a sense because at the beginning of this playthrough, I told you guys, hey, we have no idea where the Forbidden Sanctuary is. It's going to take us a while to find it. And then from there, we'll go and try and work our way through it. Well, guess what? We've already, it seems, found it. This is the Forbidden Sanctuary. So what I'm terrified about now is that I am completely unprepared 
prepared for this. I'm also a little bit more worried now that I've found this bloodied note uh, for this explorer that if we continue through the Forbidden Fortress, I could see myself get killed off. Now, I do want to see what's in that next area beside us there to the east just to get an idea as to how this branches out. But at the same time, I got to be very, very careful because it sounds like most of the people that have gone in here have not met a good end. So what I'm going to do is I am going to reveal or pathfind to the east here so we can see that next one. But that's probably, and I say probably because I don't know what's going to happen, the last thing we're going to look at in here before we try to get out. The card states vertigo. A short section of the hallway has collapsed and a relatively narrow ledge is now the only way to continue in this direction. You need to focus your mind and concentrate if you are to make it pass. Players may discard three cards with the keyword will from their hands and or inventories in order to discard this immediately. So we can kind of will our way past this or we can go ahead with an action which is considered a think or compose myself action and we pull one action card looking for one success and of course the success side of this is you conquer it and reach the other side. The failure on this states your body refuses to obey, the ledge is crumbling and you cannot overcome the fear that it will not support you. Each involved character takes a 103 card. Now, I don't want to go any further here because as you can see, like I said seconds ago, I'm not prepared for this. Even if I get past this, getting into the next section, I might get into a situation where I get stuck. I don't have what I need to even progress. There is no reason to go any further in this place until I feel completely ready for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave. I am going to spend an action to head back down. And the worst part about this is I have to expend two action cards to do this, to go back down through the pool of water, which is exactly what I'm gonna do, but it guarantees my success. Let's go ahead and pull two action cards and at least I get to keep one of them if I wish. Here are the two cards that I pulled. You can see on the bottom left-hand side, we have the walking stick. The walking stick sounds like it could be quite useful. It's good for moving actions and it's also good for fighting actions. So that's something that's worth talking about. On the right hand side, we have the camouflage outfit. Now this one excites me because on the bottom left hand corner right here, this icon is for hunting. And the one on the far right hand side, that one is for being stealthy or hiding. And those are things that could come in very, very, very useful if we run into any type of creatures or anything or one on this seventh con we have no idea what we're going to run into but that sounds great and then on top of it if you remember when we head back down through the pool the resource that happened to be in that very first uh card that we placed uh at the beginning of the game which is where we'll reside when we go swimming down through this pool there was foliage in as a resource in that area which gives a minus two to crafting this camouflage outfit so instead of it being a three action card spend or energy spend it's now down to one in order to get that camouflage outfit into our inventory and by crafting it that to me sounds like a really good idea so I'm gonna go in this case with the camouflage outfit we're gonna place this skill card in our hand the other one is gonna be discarded so being that we were successful at taking this action right here the swim action we return all the cards on the board and in the past and put 149 card into play then each player places their figure onto it Mary has emerged from the water and she is outside of the Forbidden Sanctuary now and she's looking around at the area trying to make a decision as to whether or not she needs to craft one of the items in her hand currently or whether she should explore to the east or west. We're going to go ahead and have Mary craft the camouflage outfit at this point because as I mentioned we were inside the Forbidden Sanctuary. Now that we're outside on this tile here we have a resource for foliage and that foliage is going to give a minus two to the check here to craft this item which means we only have to pull one action card to do it now. Definitely worth doing at this point. And the card we've pulled, which was successful in the end, and also for the first time you guys are seeing the seven there. So remember that special power that we have on Mary. We haven't activated it yet, but if I wanted to activate it by discarding a card that has the terminology or keyword skill,
skill on it, I could turn those sevens into successes. Now on this action, no use for that whatsoever. This was already a success before I even flipped the card. The great thing is the card that I flipped happens to be a very useful one, potentially in the future. So this I'm gonna place in my hand. Mary has completed crafting the camouflage outfit. I'll put a die here to represent the durability, which is matched to what is in the top right hand corner of the card. And we now can take advantage of spending the pips on this die in order to reduce the durability of this camouflage to help us when we are hunting as well as when we're trying to be stealthy or hide. For Mary's next action, I'm gonna to choose to pathfind to the west. Well, this isn't the best outcome ever, a spider bite. Your calf is itching uncomfortably. Examining it, you notice a nasty red spot. You must have been bitten by a spider and you can only hope it has not laid its eggs under your skin. Now you'll see a red trim around the action that's on this particular temporary event. And that states that all players involved in the current action must take the action collectively. Other players may not get involved in it. Now in this case, doesn't apply, I'm playing solo so we can and completely ignore that it's going to be just me dealing with this i have to make a decision though i have to choose whether or not i want to try to pass this and have this spider bite heal on me which you can see is the top action or it states down below eggs under your skin certainly not possible banish this now it might sound like that could be the best option because you're simply just going to go ahead and take the card and chuck it away so failing on purpose in other words in other words don't even draw any action cards just chuck it and take the bite but it's sounds like this spider is not a normal spider potentially so that could come back to bite you ironically so the question becomes do i want to burn cards you can see it's a zero plus for the action how many cards am i going to burn to try to get those two successes is really the question i've got to ask myself i'm going to go ahead and try to pull action cards to attempt to succeed and i'm going to do something that's very risky i'm only going to pull two cards that probably isn't the best odds for me, meaning that I need to be very, very lucky on the cards that I pull, uh, because, you know, pull it, hoping for a success on every card, that's gonna be tough. But we might get lucky with some half star action there too. So we'll see how it goes. I don't really wanna expend three action cards to bump up my chances, even though that's probably where the odds sit best in my favor in terms of the sweet spot. So we're gonna go ahead and grab two cards and see how this pans out. Let's go ahead and do it. First card off the top is a half star. That is not going to be good. I really hope I get something else that can work with that. Second one is a curse. Oh no, a curse here does nothing. Uh, during this draw from the action deck, it's only later when the action deck is depleted and you have, and you're drawing from your discard pile going forward. If you pull a curse, you die. In this case, it just gums up my hand and I don't get successes from it. So as you can see, not only did I burn action cards and energy trying to heal myself and treat myself, I failed doing it, which means this card is going to be banished. Just before I banish that card though, I've placed the curse card in my discard pile. This card here, Knowledge is Power, is a great one to put into my hand because this is actually going to give me experience. And experience is very useful. So I'm going to take this and place it in my hand. And just so you're aware, we're currently at four skill cards in my hand with that blue hand icon. My limit is five. With that exploration card resolved, we now go ahead and place the number that's stated right here on our card 56 over here and we'll read the text on it. Rocks peek out from the surface of the water and if you're careful enough, you should be able to get across without getting wet. So our options have expanded here and as you can see, we could potentially move to the next card here to the left. If we wanted to move to the next card, we would have to take an actual move action to do so. So long as your path is not blocked, you can actually move as far as you want to move. In this case, I can move as far as right here. Here. There'll be examples later on where I can actually take a move action from a from a card I'm on, like this one right here, and move multiple cards, which is very, very useful when you want to move quite quickly as long as nothing is blocking that movement. Now that we know what's on the west side of us, I'm also intrigued at what's on the east side of us as well. So I'm kind of tempted to actually check that out, but after being bit by a spider going the one way, I'm not too sure I'm gonna run into anything too positive on the opposite side. But what the heck, I want to know more, so let's go ahead and do it. 
It looks like I found some hot stuff. It says there are fumaroles between you and your destination. You notice that the most numerous ones spurt their gases less frequently. Take a 045 card and apply consequence A if you decide to walk on the yellow holes or consequence B if you decide to walk on the white holes. So in terms of what we just read for this hot stuff card, we have a total of 22 yellow holes and 21 white holes. And it states that you notice the most numerous ones spurt their gases less frequently. So the most numerous ones, the most numerous one being 22 is the yellow holes. So those are the ones that are spurting their gases less frequently. So I'm gonna choose to actually walk on the yellow ones. And if I want to do that, I'm gonna take 045 and apply consequence B. You pause watching the pattern of the venting steam, trying to time your run. You dash towards the white ringed holes. The scalding steam does not shoot from the ground again until you are well clear. Take 1003 card. An incident from your previous expedition comes to your mind. Harvey was so excited about the discoveries made during the first two weeks on the continent that he neglected to eat or get enough sleep. When the first difficulties came, he was the first one to die. And we've gained our very first experience point for Mary. And you can see in the top left-hand corner, there's a book icon. So this card will be sitting underneath our satchel and journal. And it states, a tip. Surviving in the first hours must be your number one concern. So finding hunting and fishing spots and gather the appropriate equipment. Find a comfortable place to rest and turn your experience points into advanced skills. At the bottom, it states, when you need to spend experience points, return this to spend one. Two rocky peaks occupy most of the inlet's surface. To the east, the ocean stretches endlessly. Wow, more options are showing up here. You can see in this particular location, there is bamboo as a resource here. That's pretty interesting. We don't have anything currently in our hand that can make use of bamboo, but it's good to know it is there. And we've gone ahead and placed out an exploration card on the table to the north. Now to the west of us, there's something that I didn't notice, but after taking a closer look at one of the cards revealed, I noticed a number on it. And as you can see with this magnifying glass here, hopefully that's visible. There is a 254 on this card. The seventh continent is filled with hidden numbers and you're going to need to keep your eyes open for any that you happen to spot as they'll likely give you a leg up or some help if you spot them. When you happen to find a hidden number, no matter where your character actually resides, as you can see currently my character is not actually on the card where I found the hidden number, so thematically you might think the character can't see that, based on the game rules it's still okay to trigger that hidden number because you found it. When you find something, what it's going to do is generally activate something you can then go and do there, usually in action. So that's the reason why resolving this, even when my character isn't at that space, doesn't matter because even if I want to engage in whatever I found, I still have to move there to do it anyway. So in this case, I found 254. I'm gonna grab that card out of the box. I'm gonna take the card the number was found on and remove it and put 254 there instead. You watch every step to avoid slipping on the moss and the lichen that covers some of the rocks. On the way, you notice that something is stuck between two reefs. Based on finding the hidden number, an action shows up based on the narrative, and that action is a take or handle action. In this case, it's a take because something is stuck between two reefs there. This now makes the decision of whether to go east or west that much tougher as more things have been revealed. Now we didn't talk about everything we found over here to the east. We've got ourselves a shovel action or a dig action going on over there. Four cards worth of energy we'd have to expend to try and go after that. We also have something where we can go take a look at something over there. We know we have the bamboo resource over there. Over here there's no resources available but we've now found something stuck between two reefs we could potentially check out. The other thing worth noting is the cost of moving out of a particular card is much higher once we come here. So if I move from here to here, I go based on this move action. But once I'm here, if I want to move somewhere else, it's going to be three, which is much higher. But that hidden number is way too tempting to ignore. So I'm going to have Mary head over there for two action cards based on this movement. 
Here are the two cards revealed, and they're both character cards. Again, successes here don't matter because the success amount we need was zero. What matters now is which card do I want to put in my hand? I've got two character cards. They're probably both great. Let's talk about them quickly. So this one right here says the following effect applies as long as you have this in hand. So when you're taking an action that has to do with fishing, something that has to do with an offer, uh, a coax, or a tame action, or you're swimming or sailing, then you get this benefit down below. Otherwise, if I take this card here, that particular symbol is also for offering, or I should say an offer, coaxing, or taming. And it says each involved character returns their tired and or frightened states. Each involved character that thereby returned at least one state may put one blue skill card from their hand on top of the action deck. Leadership sounds like the card I want to take here. It's the one that's pulling at me the most because it would help me with any tired or frightened states that I might acquire as I go along. So Mary has now moved to this new location and I did decide to take the leadership card and add it into my hand. So now I have five blue skill cards, which is my limit. I'm gonna go ahead and interact with this 082 card as it costs me no actions to do so, no successes needed. Let's pull it and find out what happens. It appears that I found a bottle. It says you pick up a bottle and break it. A piece of parchment tumbling out amidst the shattered glass. Immediately after this is revealed, take a 176 card from the adventure deck if available. No way, now this is really cool. We found ourselves a treasure map here. It says the place this map points to must certainly conceal a buried treasure. Keep your eyes open. And down below, it's got the shovel icon, which is the dig action. Take a card whose number is equal to the number of your terrain card plus 16 from the adventure deck, if available. If it is not the right card, return it. We'll definitely be placing this card under our satchel and journal. That was well worth going after. This game is loving to just toy with me right now. I didn't want to necessarily go east right away. I wanted to check the west out. And then when I did, it's kind of pushing me back towards the east again because we have the availability to actually shovel or dig something out of the ground over here. And with this treasure map, there's a potential, it's not guaranteed based on the card we just read, there's a potential that the numerical value we add to it could give us an item that's maybe even better than what we expect. Now, the only way we'll be sure is by checking that thumbs up icon when we grab the card. If we got the right one and everything lines up, then we get to reveal it and keep it. If it's not the right card, as it's stated on the treasure map, we have to return it. So it, in other words, means you're literally searching for buried treasure among a number, most likely, of different spots on the seventh continent to dig things up, which is pretty thematic and very, very cool. But seeing as we're on this side, we are definitely gonna check out this area to the west of us by revealing this exploration card. Thinking ahead, you take some time to ponder your possible options going forward to survive in this hostile environment. One involved character may discard one card with the keyword will from their hand or inventory in order to obtain success during the result step of the following action. This is a think action. Zero cards are required to be pulled, one success is needed, and if we do it, Eureka, I've got it. One involved character may choose one blue skill card in the action deck or the discard pile and add it to their hand. Otherwise, we just lack inspiration. This could be really good because we could pull something very useful out of the discard pile. Now, normally I'd be all over this as this gives me the opportunity to bring something out of my action deck or the discard pile into my hand, which can be quite powerful. However, I already know in my discard pile, there is a character card that I'd like to get as well as a walking stick that I'd also like to potentially get back out of the discard pile to help me with the movement cost of things. But I already have in my hand a card, a blue skill card that allows me to do this. So this is something that I don't necessarily need to do right now, especially when in order to actually get it, I need to burn action cards to get a success. Whereas the remember card that's in my hand doesn't require any actions cards to be pulled and it's a guaranteed success. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually pass by this one. So purposely pulling nothing in order to fail it, it states you lack inspiration. And in this case, I guess I do. The eyelet is narrow and uncomfortable. Apart from a few patches of red seaweed, the only type of plant in this sandy soil is a short, sickly weed. 
Another part of the seventh continent has been revealed for us. You can see here, it looks like we have some steam holes venting out. We have some penguins just south of that and just north of those steam vents. We also have that sickly looking seaweed. So there's a couple spots here we could interact with action wise, but after the last step, and the fact that I remembered that I have that remember card in my hand, I'm gonna actually go ahead and use that now to pull something out of my discard pile. And the card that I'd like to retrieve from the discard pile after using this remember card action for zero action cards pulled and no successes needed is the walking stick. This was a tough call because there's a character card in my discard pile that I also like, but you know what? The reduced movement cost is going to really help me out as I want to bounce around these specific spots of the continent. Next, I'm gonna play another skill card from my hand. This one's called Knowledge is Power. So basically I have to do a think or concentrate type action here with one card pulled. There is no plus on it though. So there's only one chance here that I could potentially get a success. If I do, then I'm gonna gain some experience. So let's see how this goes. We'll pull the top card off of the deck. And we actually got the curse relating to the curse we're trying to lift. And that is a failure. So we'll go down to the bottom or black portion of this card and take a look at what happens. Each involved character must discard all Knowledge's power cards they have in hand and discard this card as well. So we will not be gaining that experience. Next, I'm going to go ahead and craft a card in my hand, the Walking Stick, and it requires that I pull two action cards from my deck, essentially two energy worth. I need zero successes, so it's guaranteed to happen. If I happen to have the wood resource at my location, it would be free to craft this. I don't and don't have any revealed tiles that I know of yet that have this resource. I'm sure I'll stumble on one eventually, but I need it right now, as you can see at the bottom of the cards revealed. The cost of moving from card to card currently in the seventh continent is quite expensive, and this will certainly reduce that going forward. Two cards off the top of the deck. Let's see how it goes. First card is, huh, ironically, Knowledge is Power. Another one of those cards. We just tried to do this, and we might have a chance to do it again in the future. Next card is, oh, a curse. Man, I've been pulling a lot of curses. Obviously, of all the cards here that I've pulled for this, being that I need zero successes, I've already gone ahead and crafted this successfully, so we are going to put the walking stick in the inventory slot number two. I have two more inventory slots after that because I already have the camouflage equipped in my inventory. And the curse card is gonna go in the discard pile. The knowledge is power card I'm gonna place in my hand. So not bad, not bad overall. We're gonna go ahead now and put a durability of four on the walking stick. And right off the bat, I really think we'll be making a lot of use of this walking stick. It's really gonna help to reduce the amount of energy or action cards I'm depleting from my deck as I try to explore more and more. I think it's time to move and to continue moving westward here. So let's go ahead and we're gonna spend three cards to move. But first, before we do, we are going to reduce the durability of our walking stick from a four on the die down to a three and based on that because we are doing a movement action we can reduce the cost of this by two so we only have to pull one action card the durability of the walking stick has been reduced and i'm going to go ahead now and pull a card from the top what do we have Perfect. We didn't need any successes anyway to do this movement, but this is going to be something we can certainly put into our hand as our fifth blue skill card. Mary Kingsley has now arrived at the next portion of the seventh continent. There's two actions here that I could do, or I could take a look over at this area as well. I'm really interested in this spot right here. Again, it has a red banner around the outside of the action. That just means that everyone would need to be doing this action at once. And again, because I'm playing solo, that doesn't matter. I'd be the only one doing this. I don't have to pull any action cards to do it and don't need any successes. So I can go straight to 047 to find out what's here. As you are about to reach the center of the islet, something slimy, similar to spit, lands in your face. Almost immediately, your skin begins to itch terribly. This certainly is going to cause us a little bit of problems. It says a colony of shellfish are buried in the sand and do not seem to like being disturbed. It is not that their defense system is dangerous, but it is certainly irritating. 
Every time a character takes an action on the terrain card this is attached to, its required number of successes is increased by one, unless they have a card with the keyword stealth in their inventory. And inventory means I would have had to craft it into my inventory. And wouldn't you know it, I actually do. I have a keyword clothing and stealth on this camouflage outfit that I've put in my inventory. So now that I know that I don't have to worry about that problem, I'm gonna do something else, something that's in my hand that I think is going to be beneficial for me. And it's this one that I just picked up recently called Examine the Notes. The card states, how about taking a few moments to study the notes that you and your companions took during your previous expedition to the seventh continent? And on this action, it states, take 250 cards. Of course, it's a successful route if you happen to actually get the success off of a one card pull. Keep one and return the other one and then discard this. Now, the reason I think this is really important to try and do right now is because of my clue card, which specifically told me if I have the opportunity to pull cards that are numbered 50, then I can do something which is related directly to my quest. So the reason this is of interest for me to do right now is because of this. It says every time a character must take one or more 50 cards, and in this case, it's the or more 50 cards, they may apply the following effect instead. Randomly take three of four, 450 cards available in the adventure deck. Reveal these three cards, one after the other. You're basically gonna make a three digit number starting with the hundreds and then all the way down to the single digits. And then take the card bearing the number you obtained from the adventure deck, if it's available. If it's not, you may return the three 450 cards you took and start over from step one. Then you return the three 450 cards you revealed. So to pull this off, we need to pull one card off the top and hope for one success. Again, I could potentially discard a card in my hand with the keyword skill, which would be my rope card, in order to guarantee that sevens would be a success. But I really don't think that I'm in a dire situation to do that right now. So I'm going to choose not to do that. We're going to see whether that pays off or not. So here we go off the top of the deck. What do we got? Hey, a success and a half, that's even better. So we do actually get to go ahead with this, which means we do get to go ahead with this. And I'm gonna choose to take this card into my hand. Forewarned is forearmed. You may discard this during the result step of an action you are involved in in order to apply the following effect, a success. This will be my fifth blue skill card in hand. So I've got the four 450 cards in my hand right now. Without looking at them, I'm gonna go ahead and shuffle these cards up. I'm going to be grabbing three, and of course it states right here, the very first one you pull is the hundreds, and then it goes down from there. So let's see what we get for the first number. A one. A four. And a four. There is a card 144 and it states, following your instinct, you pull your journal out of your satchel and open it to a random page. To your great surprise, you find Secret of the Sanctuary, one of six, a partially faded enigmatic note. This is pretty crazy. I pulled a combination of numbers that literally somehow gave me the first of what appears to be six secrets in the Forbidden Sanctuary. I have no idea how we landed the first one, but I can tell you right now that's probably a good thing. I'm guessing, I'm not sure if these will be in order in terms of the information they give us, but that's pretty crazy. I again, don't know the odds of this, and this is the first time I'm playing this curse, so I have no idea what I'm getting myself into right here. Okay, so below this it says, room after room, no less than six lethal traps, each associated with the eye of death. We leave clues for each of the trough room, if I'm saying that correctly, oh, hundreds of snakes, dozens of spiders, Less than 10 butterflies indicate. Look carefully at the door. Any mistake could have disastrous consequences. John Smith. The Eye of Death, as you can see, is right on one of these cards that we pulled as well. So again, I don't know, but I'm gonna probably just note down the numbers associated with each of the symbols that I'm seeing here in case for some strange reason that comes into play later on. This Secret of the Sanctuary card does have a book icon in the top left-hand corner, so I can go ahead and place this underneath or inside of my satchel and journal. Hey, we are making progress here. 
Next, I'm gonna craft the bolus card from my hand, which is a blue skill card, and you can see on it, to craft it costs two actions or more. I need zero successes, so really just two energy or actions spent. However, if I'm in a space with a resource like stone, which I am, then I can take one off of that, so it's only gonna cost me one card to do this. Definitely gonna do this because, as you can see from the card, it's gonna help me out with hunting eventually when I hopefully find something I can kill to eat. One action card off the top of the deck results in the think card and again it didn't matter how many successes we got here and i certainly will be taking that and placing it in my hand the bolus has now been created and it only has a single durability which pretty much means it'll be able to be used once it's very very powerful though as tempted as I am to actually interact with this action up here in the top left hand corner of the card I'm on, I actually want to pathfind first and find out what's going on even further west. So let's go ahead and flip that over and see what we find. Check this out. We found ourselves a life jacket. It says you've laid hands on a life jacket in poor condition. I am absolutely going to place this into my inventory with a durability of four. This is an example of a card that you can literally just take. There's no no crafting necessary, we just found it. I like what I see here in terms of the setup for my inventory and how things have panned out thus far. There are about 300 yards between the continent and the small islet. This is pretty awesome. If I think this is what it sounds like it might be a connection to the continent itself, that's pretty crazy that we found the life jacket just before discovering this. Let's go ahead and flip this over and find out more. No way, this is really, really cool. The fact that the life jacket showed up when it did and it's a completely random card that comes from a deck of cards all with the Roman numeral one on it and it just happened to be the life jacket right when we literally could use it. That's nuts, that's craziness. Uh, almost seems set up, but it's not, I promise you, completely random. I have no idea how that card landed there like that, but it is amazing, which is why I'm super excited for it. It says right here, the sea looks serene and calm. A sandbar should enable you to wade a fair distance quite safely, but it would be wise for a craft to avoid it. So what you're seeing here is two different card numbers, 120 and 125. You got a banner here. Again, we don't have that particular banner or the icon associated with it, but the 125 card is the one I'm actually currently standing on. So we know that this is correct. It states down below we can do a swim action here for one card or more if we want to add into it at zero successes. Then it says to put a 120 and so essentially we're going swimming if we want to actually reveal cards on either side if they haven't been revealed, uh, basically moving from one side to the other. We're on the 125 side, we'd be going to the 120 side if I decide to go swimming. Here is my biggest issue with that right now. Given that our overarching goal is to get inside the Forbidden Sanctuary, which we've already visited, I believe, once before, as we saw very early on in the video, that was quite shocking that it was literally right here. I don't really want to leave this area until I've explored the major components of it. Not necessarily every single action that I could potentially take, but certainly areas that I haven't uncovered yet would be of big time interest. Now, the other reason it could be worth it to come over over here is the fact we have a walking stick now and moving from this space all the way over here would only cost two action cards from the top of the deck minus two because of the walking stick so it literally would cost me nothing except durability on that stick to move my character from here all the way over to here and then be able to interact if I want to with some things here plus reveal what's going on to the north. I think I need to do that prior to actually throwing the life jacket on and heading across the seventh continent because who knows how much this might open up to. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna knock my durability down on my walking stick from a three down to a two. This is gonna take care of the cost of movement completely from where Mary is currently, and she's gonna move herself all the way over here. Now that we're over here, we've got options. So right here, I can go ahead and observe this location right here, 158, which I'm definitely going to do. 158 states, small animal tracks can be seen on the ground here. A nearby boulder is downwind from the tracks and could provide you with some decent cover from which to keep watch. It appears we've found ourselves a hunting spot. This could be very, very good. You can see right here, the hunting action can be taken for two action cards or energy to get three successes or above. And thank goodness we have ourselves something crafted to help us out with that 
which makes things a lot easier. You can see here, based on the number of successes, we get a certain number of cards. We don't know what those cards will be just yet. Now, as tempting as that hunt may be, I'm gonna hold off on it just for now so we can take a look at what's going on by pathfinding to the north. Very, very interested to see what's up there. Plus, we don't have to spend any action cards to do this, and it might give us a little bit of an opportunity to make a judgment call on where we should spend our actions. So let's go ahead and reveal this. Well, this backfired pretty heavily. It says cursed. Maybe I shouldn't have done this. It says anxiety overcomes you. Despite the cold temperatures, you are sweating profusely and start to shake uncontrollably. The action here, which we must take right now, is a think or considered a compose myself action. Zero cards in the action deck are required to be pulled, but there's a plus symbol so we can take as many as we want. And then we're trying to get two successes. If we do, you're able to calm yourself and you take a 003 card and shuffle any curse cards you just drew back into the action deck. So that's still not good. Uh, although the number of skill card, or I should say curse cards we've already pulled and put into the discard pile is pretty crazy. So I'd be surprised if we see any more, but you never know. And then below it, it says if we fail, after a long struggle, you regain composure. Each involved character takes a 101 card, except for those that are tired, they take a 103 card instead. So end of, the, end of the story here with this one is I don't want to fail this. Now I have some cards in hand that are certainly going to help me. I got that one card partway through here called Forewarned is Forearmed, which allows me to get a success. So that certainly might come in handy. So I've decided to go ahead and pull just two cards to try and get these two successes. As I mentioned during the result step, which is essentially when you flip the action cards over that you've chosen, I can then use a blue skill card in my hand, the one I just mentioned to gain one success. So I think pulling two cards is enough to get me or net me another success that would be enough in total. We'll see how it goes though. So first card off the top here of the action deck is a seven and a half star. Ouch. Okay, so that's not good. Now remember, the seven would only be helpful if I had it triggered my character's ability, which I chose not to do because I didn't want to get rid of the rope right now. Uh, let's go ahead and pull the next card and hope for something better. Oh my goodness. And a shovel. Are you kidding me? We're even in a space with a shovel. What the heck? <laughs> Everyone's going to think this game is rigged. It's not like this, I promise you. I've played this game before, but the cards are coming up at the perfect time. So not only did I get the success here, but on top of it, I'm now going to go ahead as part of the result step, and I'm going to place this card, Forewarned is Forearmed, for an additional success. I can discard this right now. So I get this right here and this one right here. That's a total of two, which means I pass this. So I calm myself and I gain a 003 card, and then I'm gonna shuffle any curse cards that I happen to draw, which I didn't back in the deck, and we're all done resolving that, uh, that particular event that just showed up. Next, I have to decide, do I want to take any of the cards I just drew and put them in my hand? I definitely want to take the shovel. The 003 card is an experience point. Another experience point. We already have one, now we have two. It states down below another tip. Examine terrain cards carefully in addition to potential hidden numbers. They may contain helpful hints, such as animal tracks suggesting the presence of wild game in the area. So this is what's really cool is each of these experience cards are going to give you these types of tips. So even if you didn't pick that up from the game itself or the rule book, the game itself as you play it is going to give you these tips along the way. You have reached the northern end. You seem to notice a strange colorful spot in the water, but you cannot really be sure from this distance. Ah, look at this. This is quite interesting. We have a couple things we could check out, observe, or look into while we're on this card, if we move there. One thing I'm noticing, though, is if we happen to move there, even with our walking stick, that basically reduces all of our movement from two, in this case, where I currently am down to zero. If I'm over here exploring, interacting on this one, you'll see that the movement cost is quite a bit higher. The terrain is likely a lot more difficult to get around. You can see there's not much of it in the first place. My guess is, just by looking at this one, is that it's going to be a rough area. I'm not sure. Maybe the things that I'm looking at are going to end up hurting me. Or it's going to cost me a lot of energy to get back out of there if I go there. There might be good things to get. I don't know if the actual risk is potentially worth it. There's also no resources there, as you can see by this icon in the bottom right-hand corner. So the question really becomes, 
Do I go ahead and go north and explore this area? Or instead of going up north, we could focus on the actual space we're in where we could go hunting. We do have an item that can certainly help us out in that regard, which would really bump up the successes for us quite a bit. Or we could focus on trying to dig up some potential treasure here. As we know, we got a treasure map earlier on, and maybe this is where something really valuable or something very interesting for the quest could potentially be found. Besides that, we also have the ability to craft an actual shovel in order to make this action cheaper. And there is actually bamboo at this location we're currently in, so the cost wouldn't be three to craft it, it'd actually be two, which is pretty good. The only downside here currently is that as of right now, we already have four items in our inventory. So unless I'm combining things in some way, there's nothing else I can do there. All those slots are filled. What I could do strategy-wise though is go hunting first, knowing full well that this weapon would be used with one durability and be gone, opening up a spot for us to create the shovel right after the hunt. Or we could say, forget that entire plan, let's just head all the way west, throw on our life jacket, and head for what seems to be the seventh continent. And that's going to wrap up the overview and part number one. I can't wait to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let me know exactly what you think I should do next. If there's multiple things you'd like to see me do, let me know in order. If you have to make a list, one, two, three, four, do it. Let me know. I'd love to find out what the community thinks I should do next. And if I get a very good push in a certain direction by a large majority, maybe we'll make that exact idea happen. Really looking forward to seeing what happens in the future videos of this. I have no idea what's in store or even how long I will survive, but I'm looking forward to doing this with you guys. So thank you guys so much for watching and as always, keep on rolling solo.